Hey guys, welcome. Thanks everyone for joining. Very excited to have you here. Happy Friday. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be using the chat box in the upper right hand corner for uh, any Q&A. Let's make this interactive. Feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, we'll also have some good amount of time at the end to, to talk about stuff. Really briefly, my name is Nathan Beckert. I run a startup called Founder Suite. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, we make a software platform for managing your investor pipeline and for doing investor updates. Before that, I spent uh, about 12 years as fractional CFO at about 100 different companies. Most of them were raising money, and so I was going out there and helping them raise money. In many cases, about half the time we were able to raise money, about half the time we did not succeed. So I've learned a few things along the way. Hopefully I can share some of those. And, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is what we put into Founder Suite, which we launched about as a company two years ago. We launched a new product um, in March of 2016, and we've had our users raise over $200 million since March of 2016, so it's very exciting to me. Um, and then way back when I was doing investment banking for later stage companies, companies going public and raising Series B, C, D rounds, so I've been kind of fundraising my entire life. So hopefully I've got a few things I've learned. If not, I'm in trouble, right? So here's how many founders approach fundraising, and it's, it's a flaw. So many founders will just say, all right, it's time to go raise some money. I'm just going to start asking everyone I know if they can connect me to VCs. And there's a couple problems with this, as Hunter Walk points out. He's a VC here in San Francisco. Um, one is it's too broad. That question is too broad, too ambiguous to, act, to be acted upon. It's also putting the hard work of figuring out who you should be talking to on the shoulders of the other person, where that hard work really needs to be on your shoulders. Back when I was doing the consulting with Venture Architects, I would spend you know, 50, sometimes 100 hours for my clients building a target list of investors. I mean, it's real, real hard work. They're are a few shortcuts, but not a whole lot of you know, real shortcuts. So this approach is how not to do it. Instead, what I want to kind of sell to you guys today is to think about your fundraising as a sales process. If you've ever been in B2B sales or enterprise sales, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You build a list of leads, you qualify those leads, you engage with those leads, and then you drive them towards a close. Um, you know, salespeople have a step-by-step -step function they take. Fundraising, very similar. We can think about fundraising as one big sales funnel, a very, very important sales funnel, one of the most important you know, sales processes you'll ever run. Um, but in a nutshell, right, you're building a potential list of investors or a list of potential investors. You're screening and filtering those investors by sector stage, removing people. Um, you're figuring out the right person to contact, if, especially if you're going after – um, venture capital firms, you know, you don't just go pitch a firm, you pitch typically a partner or champion at that firm who can do your deal, who does your type of deal. You're figuring out how to reach those people. Uh, it's, the, it's all about the warm introduction, and we're going to cover that in more detail. And then you're getting into the discussions with these investors. You're having meetings, follow-up calls, follow-up meetings, presenting your, your business plan and everything else. And then you're getting into due diligence, which is like a deep dive into your business and your, you know, legal structure and everything, your cap table. I mean, there's an extensive list of things that happen in due diligence. And then ultimately, you're selling shares of your company or if you're doing a convertible note, you know, you're doing a note. But really, fundraising is just one big, important sales process, and we can break it down into its step-by-step -step parts. And I like doing this, especially for first-time founders who haven't raised money before, because it, it removes a lot of the like, like anxiety and ambiguity about fundraising if we can break it into a step-by-step action plan. Okay, step number one is building this funnel. Um, especially if you're at the seed round, I say you, know, you need at least 100 names on your list, uh, probably more like 200. If you're at the Series A, that number goes down a little bit, more like 30 to 50 is a good benchmark. But, you know, I'm assuming most of you folks are raising seed rounds, so I'm going to kind of talk about that. Um, when we, you know, the reason you need uh, 100 to 200 names on your list is because you're going to get rejected almost all the time. 
Um, I say here 100 pitches to get three to five commitments is pretty typical. When we were raising our round, we raised a, a seed round of just under a million dollars. I pitched over 200 investors and ended up with one seed fund and 10 angels. So you can do that math. That's about a 5% commit rate, 5% conversion rate. Um, you know, that also means you are getting rejected 95% of the time, which is why you need a large list at the top of your funnel. So a couple ways to build that funnel, build that initial list of, say, 150 names, 100, 200 names. Angel list is pretty useful. There's roughly 24,000 or so investors on there, um, you know, a lot of angels, but they also have quite a few VCs on there. You can search by different criteria. Um, we have a, an investor database we've built in Founder Suite. It's pretty basic. We've got about 50,000 investors in here tagged by market tag and location tag. I'll just show you that really quick. Um, it's uh, You have to pick the, um, the tag itself. So start typing, you know, the name of, of your industry, or maybe you're in FinTech, let's do something else. FinTech, you have to pick from the tags, and then we go and pull investors that we've tagged with that, and we've um, assembled their, their social profiles, their LinkedIn, their Twitter, their Facebook feed, things like that. Um, and most people will come in and you know, kind of browse the short bio, and then if they look interesting, they'll open up you know, their other social links to do a little bit more digging, and if they look good, then you add them to your board, add to research. Um, I might add, you can also just purely search by location. You can either filter down these results by location, or in many cases, it makes sense to just search only by location. Okay, so that's how to use Founder Suite, and that's free, by the way. Uh, does your database, Calvin, thanks for the question. Does database allow the user to find investors in a specific startup? No. A great segue because my next slide is Crunchbase. Crunchbase is exactly what you're asking here, Calvin. Um, this is how I use Crunchbase. You can just search on Crunchbase, but I, the way I like to use Crunchbase is I find a company that's similar to mine but not directly competitive. I plug them into Crunchbase and I see who invested in them at my specific round. So that's how I use Crunchbase. I you know make a list of like every company who's kind of in my space or general. Um, general category that's not a competitor, and I go figure out who funded them, and I add them to my target list. Um, the other way I like to use Crunchbase, like now that we have a seed fund, um, I can go in and see who that seed fund co-invests with. That's kind of useful too. So other places to add to your funnel. Again, we're aiming for you know 150, maybe 200 names in our funnel. PE Hub. Inside Venture and Venture Pulse, these are daily newsletters you can subscribe to. They're free. Um, you get an email you know, once a day with all the funding announcements that happened the day before, the week before. And uh, I just kind of skim those, and I both pick out investor names, and also I notice companies that are similar to mine, and I go back and put them into different space. Conference speakers. Um, conferences are actually pretty, pretty useful, especially if you're in a new or emerging space like you know, drones or uh, artificial intelligence or something like that, there's always a, a explosion, a mushroom mean of conferences that, you know, pop up. And investors love to make a name for themselves to kind of build their brand by getting out there and speaking. So if you just go look at the agenda of conferences in your space, you can probably pick up some good leads. Quora is actually pretty useful. Um, people have spent a lot of time answering questions on Quora, like who are the top Ten seed investors in Austin, Texas, for example. So go browse around there a little bit. I always get lost whenever I go on Quora. I always get like sucked down the rabbit hole of other questions, it's, and then I find myself like five hours later, you know, reading about uh, sailing techniques or something. Um, Pitchbook, Mattermark, and CB Insights are paid databases. Uh, they're all pretty good. They have databases of investors. And the only issue is they're very expensive. So I think PitchBook, don't quote me, but I think it's, you know, 40000 or $50,000 a year. I'm not sure how much Metamark is these days. Um, and then CB Insights, I think, is closer to even $100,000. But these guys all have armies of data scientists scrubbing data. You can get 
you know, a lot of cross-reference data. You can get like valuation data. So if you have access to these databases through, for example, a university or an accelerator, or maybe you know a, an investor who subscribes to it, you know, really useful way. I unfortunately have no access to these databases. Michael, you had a question. In general, how much are these tools U.S. centric, and how much do these tools work in Europe too? I think they're all pretty, um, pretty broadly diverse. Um, you know, I know our database. We've got lots and lots of investors in in Europe and other places. I was on Intercom last night chatting with a user who was in Australia, and I plugged in all the cities in our database. You have to search by cities in our database, I should mention that. So I went in and plugged in, I actually Googled like top 10 cities in Australia by population, and then I plugged those into our database, like Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and it came out with about 26 pages of results. So that's just one example of, you know, non-US. And I know that, you know, most of these other databases are pretty international as well. I would say they probably don't cover um, parts of Asia, you know, China, uh, Japan, uh, you're probably going to have less data in there. But I think Europe, Canada, England, Australia, places like that are pretty well covered. Okay, moving on. So bottom line here, as Yoda said, when you decide it's time to build that funnel, you kind of just have to tune your radar in to looking for investors, and you start to kind of see them all over the place. Okay, next step in our process is qualifying these leads. So you remember uh, using the B2B sales as a metaphor. A good salesperson doesn't just pitch and chase every sales lead that comes in the door. He spends time qualifying those leads, prioritizing those leads, ranking those leads, and removing leads, not chasing certain leads, right? And we want to do that same thing with our investors. This is even more important. Um, so we have that list of 150. Now we want to remove maybe 20 to 30% of the people off that list. Anyone who's invested in competitors, you don't even want to talk to them. There's no value for you in talking to someone who's invested in a competitor. It could only hurt you. They could pass your information on to your competitor. You know, uh, I've seen that happen. I've seen pitch decks forwarded along, all that stuff. It's, it's ugly. If you're talking to a venture firm and they haven't raised a new fund, if they haven't raised their own new fund in the last two or three years, then they're probably only doing follow-on deals in their existing companies. And so you might deprioritize them. I made that mistake when I was raising money of talking to some of these funds that hadn't raised any money. And they'll take a meeting, and then you drive, you know, an hour and a half down to meet with them, and they say, well, we really only have room for one more deal in our portfolio. You know, it's kind of a waste of time. Same with angels. If you plug someone into AngelList and you see all their deals are from 2014, they're probably taking a break from investing. You know, it doesn't mean you should remove them from your list, but uh, it might make sense to deprioritize them a bit. Wrong sector, wrong stage, and wrong geographic location. This stuff should be pretty intuitive, um, but sometimes it can trip up founders like you'll you'll find a, a VC fund that says they're growth capital. Growth capital sounds good, right? You want to grow. That's why you're raising money. Well, growth capital actually means later stage. That means Series B, Series C. That doesn't mean seed. So if you're very early stage, a growth capital fund, you know. Also, very large funds, you know, these $500 million funds or $800 million funds, sometimes they'll have a seed, seed program, but oftentimes they need to put to work bigger checks so if you're very early stage, they might not be a, fo a focus for you. And then wrong geographic location. You know, this just comes from looking at their website, looking at their LinkedIn pages, and they usually will state it explicitly if they focus on a region. I found a couple of investors that looked really interesting for me up in Seattle, and then I dig in, and, they, you know, I see that they specifically state they invest in Pacific Northwest startups. That's not us. I didn't chase them, you know. No point in chasing something, wasting time. And then bad reputation. This is a little bit trickier to figure out. If you're in an accelerator, often that's a good way to kind of compare notes with your peers about, um, you know, different investors. I know that Y Combinator has something called Bookface, which is like this database they have uh, that you can go in. And, you know, other people have gone through Y Combinator and kind of added some information about investors. And then, like, Founder Institute has something called thefunded.com, which is open to everyone. 
um, and you can go in. It's kind of old. It's about 10 years old. But you can see actual ratings and reviews. It's like a Yelp for VCs. That's the funded.com. So the key point here is you really want to be diligent in crossing people off your list, kicking them off your list so you don't waste time chasing these because it can really chew up all your time if you're chasing, like, you know, leads that are poor fit. Trust me, I've been there way too many times. Okay, now that we've, you know, built our list, we've qualified our list, shortened that list down, now we want to figure out how to reach everyone on that list. Uh, LinkedIn is, you know, typically what we use here, right? There's no magic to that. And basically, you'll, you know, you plug, if you're using Founder Suite, we've hopefully go grab their LinkedIn uh, link. If you're not using Founder Suite, just plug in your target into LinkedIn and see if you have any mutual connections. If you have more than one mutual connection, congratulations, um, there is a hierarchy of who to ask for the intro to your target. Tim is your target in this scenario. So the hierarchy goes like this. The very best person to ask for that intro is someone who's made Tim money in the past. Um, this is maybe a founder he invested in that had an exit or IPO. Tim will take that meeting in a heartbeat, in a lightning fast response. It's amazing. Second best is someone maybe Tim has co-invested in, right? Another investor, maybe an angel who's fed deals to Tim. Third best on that list is probably someone who he's currently invested in, like a, a company founder uh, in his current portfolio. Fourth best are, you know, hopefully there aren't any of these guys on the phone today, but the, the guys and gals who are often like the biz dev person at a big law firm or an accounting firm. Um, those guys and gals know everyone. They make a lot of intros, but because they make so many intros, oftentimes it's a weaker signal. Not, nothing against those people, the biz dev people at your law firm, but, you know, sometimes those intros don't go too far. And then kind of, you know, last on the list are just the random people that Tim met at a conference one time connected to on LinkedIn, but he doesn't really know very well. It's hard to figure that out sometimes. If you have zero connections to Tim, what do you do? Um, the best approach is to look at Tim's portfolio, find a couple founders that look interesting or friendly, reach out to them with a cold email saying, hey, I see you know, Tim's invested in you. I'd love to hear how it's been working with him. He's been on my, my list for a long time. Um, has he been helpful? Get a dialogue going with that founder, and then it's okay to ask them to make an intro for you. You know, founders are usually pretty good about helping other founders. Last, if you absolutely can't do, you know, no connections and you're not willing to take the time to, uh, to network your way into an intro to Tim, is the cold email. Cold email is really, really ineffective. It doesn't work very well at all. I've seen people try it, like, in a big way. And, um, you know, the thing is, Tim's getting so many warm intros every day that these cold emails often just don't even get opened up. If you're going to do cold email, though, make it really personalized, um, you know, explicitly stating, make it short, but explicitly stating why Tim is right for you, why you're reaching out to him. Don't ever do a blast, you know, like a, a mass blast to investors. That is just, that will hurt you more than anything. So uh, I really don't recommend quote email, but, you know, it happens sometimes where you just have no way in to a person and you've got to do it. So while we're in LinkedIn, there are a few more things we can do to add to our funnel. I'm going to jump over here. So here's my LinkedIn page. This is just my, my home page on LinkedIn. And all I'm going to do here is go up here and type in the word investor. Or you could use the word angel, doesn't really matter. And so then I will come over here and go second degree. And then, you know, let's pick a location just for kicks. I'll do United Kingdom. Okay, so, you know, this is what I've just did here is I've searched my network for everyone who's tagged themselves as investor that's two or one degree of separa separation away from me um, in the UK. And so if I was a UK startup, you know, I've got 2,000 people that are one degree away from me 
So theoretically, I have 2,000 people that I could reach via a shared connection. Uh, and then what I do is go through this list, and, then, and granted, this is kind of a long list, but what I do is go through this list and open up anyone who looks interesting into a new tab. I open up, you know, sometimes 100 tabs at a time, and then just kind of go through and pick out anyone who looks interesting, add them to my funnel. Because, again, theoretically, I should be able to reach them because I have a mutual connection. So it's just another way to kind of populate your funnel with potential uh, warm leads. Okay. So that is another kind of hack. Uh, it is time-consuming, right? There's no way around that. I've seen people run scripts and do stuff like that. I've never been able to successfully kind of hack it. LinkedIn's pretty aggressive about shutting you off if you've got like a bot running. But if anyone's figured that out, I would love to hear it. Uh, email me, <laughs> Nathan, if I'm um, All right, so step number four. So we've built that list of 150. We've qualified it down, maybe 125. We figured out how to reach everyone on that list. Um, and now, you know, we're re just about ready to start our fundraising. But first, we need to put all these leads into a tracking system. There's a reason, you know, San Francisco's skyline is now dominated by Salesforce Tower because salespeople need a CRM to track all the discussions they're having. The same things happen when you're fundraising. You're going to be talking to 125 investors. You need a way to track all the discussions you're having, where you're at in the funnel with everyone, all the follow-up items. Um, so I used to build these spreadsheets for my, my clients when I was consulting. You know, obviously the spreadsheet's pretty flexible. The problem is it gets really messy really quick. Um, so here's just my quick product plug is, uh, bear with me, uh, but we made this Founder Suite system, which is like a visual CRM tool. So I'm going to give you just a two-minute tour of this. But you can see it's like, it's structured for fundraising. So we have our research column, our contacted pitch, due diligence committed, or said no. And so your job basically is, you know, to be moving people between columns. Your job is to be moving everyone from left to right through your funnel. It's funnel management. Um, and, um, you know, so you need a way of tracking all that. I'll show you a couple other quick things. You kind of a couple hacks and best practices, and, and I think these apply whether you use Founder Suite or whether you use some other CRM. Um, these tips apply. One is to get your broader network involved in your fundraise. So I made a column here. You can add columns by clicking these dots over here. I made a column called Steve B. Lee. Steve Bennett is one of my advisors, and so I made him an empty column, and then I invited him in to be a uh, a team member, which is under settings, and then I asked him to, to add people from his network to my funnel. So, and I did this for about seven of my investors. Each one added, you know, between five and 15 investors. I basically added about 60 new warm leads to my funnel by asking my advisors to come into my board and add people to my board. So really, you know, easy, effective way. Even if you're using Founder Suite's free plan, which allows up to 25 investors, you can still invite people in to and uh, have them populate your board. The other couple things I've done, I'll just show you really quickly. I made a column called No Response. This is where I drag all the people who uh, just never respond to me or kind of like, you know, ghost ignore me. And they also made a column called Revisit for Series A. And this is where I put people, and you're going to get a lot of these typically, who say, I like what you're doing. It's a cool product, but you're too early. Come back to me later. And so I put all those people into Revisit for Series A. And then, of course, said no is the hard no's. People just said, this is not a fit for me. Um, the other quick thing I'll show you, you know, so it's just funnel management, right? This is like funnel management 101. The other quick thing I'll show you is um, when, if you're raising money with like co-founders or advisors, being able to assign owners to every lead I think is important, right? Howard's the target investor. Having someone be owner of that lead is pretty critical. Um, I mentioned staying on top of all the activities. Every time you have a, a meeting with an investor, it usually leads to like one or two or three follow-up actions, right? Another meeting another call, a task, like some due diligence prep. 
So, you know, use a CRM to stay on top of all that stuff, push it out to your calendar. And then, um, and then you can also attach files of, over here, which is often very useful, right, to keep all your discussions, files, notes about this target investor in one place. And then finally, last bit of the demo here is uh, email synchronization. So this automatically pulls in all your email threads with that investor. So especially if you're doing a fundraise with, you know, co-founders or advisors, it's useful to have all that information in one central place. Okay, getting back to our talk here. Whether you use a spreadsheet, whether you use Founder Suite, whether you're a Salesforce master and you just want to use what you already know, that's fine too, but you absolutely need some way of tracking all these discussions. You will go crazy. Your fundraise will get sloppy and messy if you don't have a CRM. <laughs> Trust me on this. I've done this so many times. Um, all right, moving on. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but before we're just about to get out there and really, you know, start hustling with investors, before we do that, just make sure your pitch deck and your model is super tight, super crisp. You've practiced your pitch, you know, five to ten times with people who've given you feedback, like hard, constructive feedback. You've built at least, at a minimum, you've built a budget, right? If you're raising a million dollars or 500K, at least show what you're going to spend that on and what milestone that will get you to, even better if you apply the business model, the forecast on that too, and actually build a good model. So I'm not going to get any deeper into that. This could be an entire talk on its own, but make sure your pitch and your budget or model are really solid. And now it's time to actually start the outreach process. So Jeff is one of my connectors. I've identified him as, you know, he, he's a, this is a real email. He's a guy that works at NASDAQ. He knows a lot of people. And I found quite a few people that he, he was the path to reach them. And so what I do is I send an email to Jeff saying, hey, Jeff, I'm, you know, doing our round here. Do you know any of these folks well enough to make a lightweight intro? And then what Jeff can do is he can quickly scan this list and write back to me saying, I know Tom, I know Mamoon, I know Jessica, I know Clark, but... Kyle, I don't know, Noah's not investing, and I don't know Zoth. So he can very quickly respond and tell me who he's willing to make an introduction with. Now contrast this to that very first slide I showed you. If I had just gone to Jeff and said, hey, Jeff, can you introduce me to a bunch of VCs? He would have to think about his entire network. He's got like 800 people in his network that are tagged as investor. He would have to think about his entire network. He would have to spend a lot of brain power coming up with a list for me. But instead, I've done that hard work, and all I'm doing is asking him who he's willing to do an intro for. Much, much more efficient. More work on your side, but it makes a more efficient fundraise. Now, for everyone that is on that list, that everyone said Jeff, and that everyone that Jeff said yes, I'm willing to do an intro, I make an email such as this. And don't get you know hung up on the specifics of this. Um, it should be short, it should be crisp, and it should be an ask for that intro. So for every single one of those, he, made, he offered to make about five or six intros, and so I do five separate emails, five clean separate emails, um, customized around the person I'm asking for the intro to. So Jeff, can you introduce me to Clint? A little bit, you know, teaser. The subject line is always very important. You want to have as much of a good, solid teaser in, the, in, in there as you can. At this point, I actually had a lot of the round committed, so I put that in the teaser. If you, if you didn't have that, you know, put something else out in, in your teaser. 150% uh, month-over-month month growth, whatever it may be, uh, or maybe number of downloads or active users. doesn't matter what it is. Have a good little teaser. Now, the body of the email, excuse me, I need to take a drink. So the body of the email should be, again, very short and sweet. Uh, Jeff, good chatting with you. I'm raising a seed round briefly about what we do. I mean, this is like the shortest elevator pitch ever. Our investor management reporting platform, super short. I'll link to my website if this investor wants to just, you know, poke in and see what I'm talking about. Here's where I ask for the actual intro. Um, I mentioned why I'm asking for the intro to Clint because he's, you know, this is somewhat generic. He's got a background on this. And then I noticed when I was looking on LinkedIn, 
that he went to the same college that my dad went to. So I customize this email if I can. It doesn't always happen, but if I can customize this, I customize it with a little personalized section here and then a link to our pitch deck. Not everyone likes to put their pitch deck um, you know, in this first email. I like to do it because I like to kind of, again, pre-qualify Clint. If he looks at my pitch deck, decides we're not even in the relevant ballpark for him, I want him to opt out versus taking a meeting and spending all the time on it. But some people like to you know, save their pitch deck for later. That's up to you. Um, but that's it. It's an ask. And then my, my connector, Jeff, can simply click forward, type a little note. Hey, Clint, do you want to take the intro to Nate? Question mark. Send. And he does this five or six times. I think I actually asked Jeff for like 10 different intros. Right, so I'm making it, you know, take less than 10 seconds for Jeff to do each one. Hey, Tom, do you want to take an intro to Nate? Hey, Bob, do you want to take the intro to Nate? Forward, forward, forward. And then, of course, it's the opt-in approach where, um, you know, Clint has to opt in to taking the intro and then Jeff connects us. Making it super easy for your connector to do their job means it will get done. If you make it hard for your connector, you know, these guys are busy, right? So don't waste your time. All right, now we are in full-on hustle mode. Um, we were getting all our connectors to be making these intros. Hopefully these, these uh, targets are responding, saying, hey, let's set up a call or meeting. And, you know, the, the point of this slide is just kind of funny. If you haven't watched HBO's Silicon Valley, definitely go watch season one. They're out there raising money. The reason I, I pointed out, though, in particular, Richard's the CEO. He's an engineer. He's an introvert. All he wants to be doing is writing computer, you know, compression algorithms. But he's got to. He's forced to get out there and hustle and pitch and meet all these investors. All these investors have big egos. They're very smart. Um, you know, but you've got to kind of switch into hustle mode, whether that's a natural state for you or not. You've got to switch into it just like Richard does. And it can be very stressful, but you can also make it fun if you just kind of you know, adjust your attitude about that. So move into hustle mode. Um, some hustle tips. Doing the intros in parallel. You know, if you follow along this process so far where we teed up all our intros and now we're asking for our connectors to make them in parallel. I call this the blitzkrieg approach. And what we're trying to do here is get momentum going around our deal. The old joke is investors can smell momentum. They can also smell desperation. So, of course, it's your job to come in smelling like momentum. Uh, the best way to get momentum around your deal is to be having a lot of meetings in a fairly condensed time frame. You know, they always, every meeting you have with an investor, they're going to ask you, so tell me about the round. How's it coming together? That's their kind of veiled way of asking, do you have momentum or not? And to the extent you can say, yeah, we've just started fundraising. We're running a pretty tight process. Uh, you know, I've, I'm having about three meetings a week, and, uh, you know, it's going well. I've got two more meetings today, and I've got four tomorrow. It's clear there's other investor interest in your deal, right? And these guys are often so much driven by fear and greed. Greed, of course, of making money and fear of missing out, losing a deal to someone else. So the more momentum you have, the more you can create that FOMO. Okay. Um, about your pitch. So, you know, I often suggest, like, if you're not sure about certain slides, uh, maybe have two meetings that day, try different variations of it, of a certain slide. Don't A-B test your entire pitch deck, but, you know, test out certain slides, see which one kind of clicks better. And then constantly improve your pitch deck. When we were raising our, our, our seed round, I would go out, have a couple meetings, have a couple pitches, come back at night, watch an episode of HBO Silicon Valley, and, you know, have a cocktail and then go in and, like, work on my pitch deck for an hour or two every night. Uh, and by the end of it, we were on version number 42 of our pitch deck. And it was really, really tight because we've been honing it the entire time. You know, you're getting feedback. You're, you're learning which slides are confusing just by kind of the body language. So continually tweak your pitch deck. And then, you know, leverage these DCs off each other. That kind of goes back up here to the extent you can indicate that you're meeting with, you know, certain folks, um, that's useful, better, of course, once you get actual term sheets. Uh, and then finally, this is a pretty important hacker tip, is be sending them monthly updates. So 
when you're fundraising, you know, fundraising to set expectations can take anywhere from, say, two to six months. Two months, if you do your fundraising two months, you are a ninja master and you're amazing. Um, you know, if you're still fundraising at month six or seven, it's probably taking too long. Maybe your deal just isn't really fundable right now. Um, usually, you know, it takes three to four months. But throughout that entire time, you should be sending a monthly update, a monthly progress update to everyone who has not told you no. You need to be keeping these guys in the loop. You need to be staying top of mind with them. Um, and you're also showing that you can execute and communicate while you're fundraising. Uh, very, very important. And just my very last little product demo, I'll just show you what this looks like. We made a, a tool for this. This is our investor updater tool. Basically six sections, um, three bullets per section is all it really takes. Uh, drag in a KPI table, um, you know, hit publish, and then that generates a, a report that looks like this. Really nice, really clean. Investors have told us they, they love this approach. Um, it generates a URL, which you then send out to investors. You can attach files if you want to attach your pitch deck. And the cool thing is you can even track and see who's opening or viewing these reports. So when we were doing our fundraising, I would use this both for my monthly updates, but I also put my, my pitch deck in here. I'll show you that too. So I uploaded my pitch deck in here, and now I can uh, – you know, just send a link to my pitch deck, and again, I can track and see who is uh, who's looking at my my deck. So, makes it very useful for the fundraising. See here, all these people opened it up. Okay. Anyway, monthly updates will. Uh, the other bit about this monthly update is it will set you apart from literally 99% of the other founders out there. Um, because not many people do this. It takes, you know, 15 minutes a month, 20 minutes a month, but it will really set you apart. Um, and then finally, you know, to the extent you can treat fundraising as a full-time commitment, that's almost never possible. But the more you can, you know, act like fundraising is your full-time job versus just kind of dabbling in it, when people sort of dabble in fundraising, their fundraising kind of takes forever and usually gets stale. So try and treat it as a full-time job. I know that's easier said than done. A couple more fundraising hacks. Um, this first one here, we did a little bit of this. Everyone I was talking to, everyone in my funnel, I was putting them and doing some retargeting ads. I had one of our angels say that every time he logged into Facebook, he saw our brand. So I think it, you know, he ended up writing a check for seventy thousand dollars. So hopefully it helped. Um, you know, this is kind of combined with the update, the monthly update piece, plus retargeting. Plus, if you have any PR that's going to be happening, maybe you have some news coming out, you can get, you know, an article written in TechCrunch. The whole point of all this is just to stay top of mind with these investors. Um, again, putting it in perspective, these investors are meeting with 25 companies a week. You know, they're taking 25 pitch meetings. They're also being uh, getting 100 warm intros a day in many cases. Really active investors will be getting 100 warm intros a day. So you need to stand out and kind of stay above the noise. Um, point number two is just putting your pitch deck online. I think this is kind of the uh, state of the art these days to be able to send a link to your pitch deck instead of attaching your pitch deck. Um, and, you know, we have a tool for that, Docsend, Google Docs. There are a bunch of these programs out there. I think even like Box and Dropbox can do that. Um, this was this third one here was suggested by a, a viewer one time. Basically, not only using LinkedIn, but also Facebook to try and find mutual connections. The premise being, um, you know, it's a stronger connection. Like, on, I think I have like 3,000 LinkedIn connections, but like 300 Facebook friends, right? So if we have a mutual friend through Facebook, it's probably stronger. AngelList is interesting. Uh, you, you Previously, you could post your profile on AngelList and hope that investors would discover you. It never really happened like that, but AngelList has changed recently, and now all the deals on there are private. Um, typically, you know, they seem to be going in the direction of syndicates. So a syndicate is basically an angel investor who writes checks, but he also brings in, you know, 20 or 50 or 100 people also writing checks. 
So they're able to write like two or three hundred thousand dollar checks by pooling their money. That's what a syndicate is. Syndicates are very good for filling out the last like two thirds of your round, not usually so much for starting your round. So if you have, you know, half or two thirds of your round already committed, look at Angelus. Angelus intro. I don't know anyone who's done it, so I can't really talk about it too much. Angel groups are always very interesting. There are, you know, angel groups all over the world. There's like a couple thousand angel groups. And like here in the Bay Area, we have Sand Hill Angels, Golden Gate Angels, Koretsu Forum. Uh, I know Southern California has a dozen or more. Um, the advantage of going through angel groups to raise money is you can get in front of, you know, 50 or 60 investors all in one shot. The disadvantage is it takes kind of a long time and a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, oftentimes you have to apply through the website, then there's a screening committee, then maybe like a, another screening or pitch committee, and then ultimately two or three months later you're at their dinner presenting at the dinner. Um, the cynic would say that these angel groups are oftentimes just social clubs and you're the dinner entertainment, but I do know people that have raised some money through them, so it's worth exploring. I just wouldn't make it a core part of your fundraising strategy. Um, and then crowdfunding always is asked. You know, there are a lot of different platforms out there. There's a lot of kind of shady platforms out there. I'm not going to like go into names, but I know people have spent a lot of time trying to work the equity crowdfunding channels. Oftentimes they spin their wheels and realize it's more, more work than if they're just pursuing traditional angels and VCs. Um, so, it's you know, I think it's an emerging market that will see some some – Good developments over time. Um, for now, you know, I think if you're a product-focused company, going on Kickstarter is always great. Um, and then some of these vertical crowdfunding platforms, like uh, Circle Up, if you're in consumer products, consumer packaged goods, or Fig is another one if you're doing uh, video games. I think are interesting. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn raises a question in the chat box. Angel groups certainly vary in quality. Absolutely. Key question to ask if angels can do deals on their own and have, group, have to group up. Yeah, that's a good point. I've seen some of these uh, angel groups that they do. It's almost like you have to convince the entire audience uh, to do your deal, and if one or two people are naysayers, you know, the thing collapses. I think you're right. Finding uh, angel groups where the angels can do their own deals higher probability of raising money. Okay, we're kind of coming to the end here, so I'm going to keep keep grinding here. This last point here, do an initial close to get some momentum and progressively signal scarcity, again, goes back to that whole concept of fear of missing out. Investors are really often driven by fear of missing out on a good deal. Um, and one way of, I don't want to call it manufacturing that or gaming that, but uh, partially doing that is to, you know, always have your round half or two-thirds full. It's much more appealing. If you already have $300,000 in commitments, for example, it's much more appealing to say you're raising a 500K round and you already have two-thirds of it committed versus raising a $1.5 million round and you only have $300,000 committed. It doesn't look like it has momentum. And, you know, you can raise the bar as you can – continue to go, especially if you're doing a uh, convertible note. Sometimes this works for price rounds too. We actually started out raising a 500K convertible note. Um, we got a commitment for that from one seed fund. It was contingent, but once they offered to put in 500K, we actually raised the amount to 750. So again, we you know have most of that round committed and we just kept raising it. So there's always just a small amount available. Um, again, I wouldn't artificially try and manufacture this but uh, optics do matter, right? Uh, everyone's looking for that oversubscribed round or that round that's almost full and you're lucky to get into it, right? Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this last one. Conspire is just another way to find mutual connections. I'm almost done here. This last slide is about herding the cats and closing your round. All, one of the hardest things to do sometimes is to get all these people you're talking to to kind of, you know, get off the fence um, and make a yes or no commitment. If you think about it again, 
our funnel metaphor. We're trying to move everyone through our funnel uh, from left to right, either into the committed column or into the said no column. So one couple tips here. When you're actually meeting with these investors, at the end of the meeting, actually ask them, so, you know, what's your interest level like? What do you think of this deal? Um, and then just shut up and let them talk. Like, let them kind of talk about their interest level. Ask them directly and let them talk about it. And oftentimes you'll get a fairly generic answer. Um, you know, well, I need to talk about it with my partners. But if they, if they add on a next step, like, oh, you know, I want to talk about it with my partners, but I'd love to have you come in next Tuesday and present again, that's a good step. If you're walking out of a meeting with the next step, that's a, buying, a, a good buying signal. Point number two is making them chase you a little bit. So, um, you know, again, at the end of the meeting with an investor, kind of go conclude it by saying, I really enjoyed telling you about Founder Suite. Um, you know, I would love to hear about how you operate, uh, how you add value to your, your portfolio companies, but in particular, I'd love to hear how you would, you know, add value to Founder Suite and then shut up and let them pitch you a little bit on what they could do for you. It kind of turns the tables a bit, changes the power dynamic a little bit, and it's good. Um, point number three here, you know, again, I mentioned this can take from two to six months to raise around, sometimes longer, um, and every investor often will require three to six pitch meetings uh, before you actually get that term sheet. And, of course, getting that first term sheet is always the hardest. Once you get one term sheet, you can use that as a catalyst to go to everyone else you're talking to and get them to kind of, you know, shit or get off the pot, pardon my French, but to make a, a yes or no decision. Um, so a lot of your hustle, a lot of your work will be getting, will be spent getting that first term sheet. Point number four, you know, even with your, your best pitch, with all the momentum you could muster, you'll have a great meeting with someone and then they just stop responding to you. I call it ghosting, right? And if you remember I showed you in my uh, Founder Suite CRM board, I actually have a column called no response. You know, it happens. It happens a lot. Uh, these investors just stop responding. I guess it's a soft way of saying no. You know, I usually follow up two or three times and then just let it drop, right? There's no point in sending them 10 more emails. Um, I do often will keep them on my, my monthly update list, but I'm, I'm not chasing them really so much. Finally, when someone does give you a verbal yes, you're out having coffee with them, they say, I like what you're doing, I'm, I'm in for 50K, then you go back to your laptop and do this handshake deal protocol by Paul Graham of Y Combinator, where you basically just say, great meeting you, just to confirm you're in for 50K on this deal, and, if, and you know, please write back. And if they write back and say, yes, I'm in for 50K, you can move them into your committed column. If they don't complete that loop, they're still just a prospect. And then last but not least, most importantly, don't stop fundraising until you actually have those wires, you know, hit your bank account. <laughs> I've seen this so many times. It's this sad Shakespearean tragedy uh, where founders get into the fundraise and they're hustling. They have some momentum going. Maybe there's a demo day coming up or something. You know, they have momentum going. They think they have enough momentum that the round's going to kind of carry it on its own, you know, they have all these other pressing issues, product issues, customer issues, so they kind of take their eye off fundraising, go back to working on the business, and then the round slowly falls apart and they end up with no money in the bank. I've seen this happen many, many times, so just keep pushing hard until the money's in the bank. Here's your gratuitous money shot as the money crosses the wire. And then finally, just putting this all in perspective, you just raised 500K or a million dollars, whatever it is, you know, congratulations. Uh, have a nice celebratory dinner with your advisors, everyone who's helped you, then get back to work on Monday and just start grinding again. You raise a million dollars, maybe that buys you 12 months of runway. That actually means you need to start fundraising again six to nine months from now, right? So you already, you know, even just a few months from now, you need to start building your target list for the next round. Um, the joke here is, uh, this was Reed Hoffman saying, startups are like jumping off a cliff and assembling the airplane on the way down, trying to hit airborne, uh, and I think that really applies. And so 
So that's it. Uh, we have some time for Q&A. Um, I'd like to use the chat box for Q&A if you guys don't mind, because uh, it's pretty noisy otherwise. Are you guys more motivated or less motivated to uh, go, raise, <laughs> go raise funding? Sometimes this talk actually turns people off from fundraising, which I think is a good thing. Are you guys still there? I hope I hope we didn't get disconnected at some point. Mm. Oh, thanks, Glenn. You mentioned setting an initial close date if early. What are some techniques like dates, milestones to get the initial smaller investors invested? So it's a really good question. Um, again, you know what we're trying to do here is create a catalyst to get people to commit or say no. Right, that's kind of the, the goal of this. Um, setting a close date is is one way of doing that. However, it's risky if you don't actually have commitments, you know, to like legitimate commitments. Just setting a close date, an artificial close date, um, can backfire, right? If you actually don't have strong enough commitments, I usually don't use that technique until I get someone to say I'm in for a meaningful amount, right? When you start to get some of these commitments, even some of the con conditional commitments, sometimes it'll be a conditional commitment, like I'm in for 50K if you find a lead investor. Uh, you can still add that to your tally, you know, to the amount you have committed, uh, even though it's conditional. Once you've sort of crossed over um, a certain threshold, and that's up to you to figure out whether it's 50%, 70%, then you can say, all right, we're going to go for an initial close here on, um, you know, July 18th, uh, and then you can go to everyone you're talking to and get them to say, I'm in, I'm in or out, right? There's, that's when you can use it as a catalyst. Um, but I wouldn't really do it until you have a meaningful number of commitments already. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? That was a good question, by the way. You guys are a quiet bunch. Usually there's a bunch of stuff. Okay, viewer number um, 17. I've had the advice from a VC that it's problematic with too many small investors. Yeah, for a later stage. Okay, so that's a good question point. You know, I think... Um, there are a couple of things you can do. If you have a lot of people wanting to write, you know, really small checks, there are a couple of things you can do. When you're actually raising your round, you can set a minimum. Um, I think when we were doing our round, I just had it in my pitch deck. The minimum investment amount is 25K. I actually had one guy come in under that, but that was sort of the minimum I wanted to accept. So if you're doing later, later stage round, of course, you could have a much higher uh, minimum commitment. Um, if you do still have a lot of smaller investments involved, you don't want them calling you all the time, right? You don't want to have 50 bosses to report to. Uh, it was super annoying. I've been in that situation. What you could do if you had a lot of small checks um, is pool them into like a syndicate. I think AngelList even has a do-it-yourself syndicate where you could literally pool, you know, 50 guys each writing $10,000 $10, checks into one syndicate, so they're one entity on your cap table. I think that's how I would approach it. Um, you know, VCs like to have clean cap tables. If you've got all this funky stuff, Aunt Gladys gave you a loan for 20K. She paid it in pennies. You know, you have all these weird scenarios on your cap table. You don't want that. Um, so I would probably bundle the, all those small fries into a, a syndicate. Uh, what is the right time? View number 27. What is the right time stage to start talking to angels, especially if you are pre-revenue and have some initial engagement? This is always a great question. This pre-revenue question comes up a lot, and I think it's an important one. There's no right answer. I mean, if you're pre-revenue, um, I would say that a good time to start talking to angels is when you have initial engagement, but also some proof of market validation. And that might not be revenue. Revenue, obviously, is very good market validation. People are giving you money. 
but even before revenue, if you have proof that people are using your product, they love your product, they're not just using it once and going away, but they're using it, they're coming back, you know, you have retention rates that are attractive, then I think it's time to start talking to angels. It's basically that sort of market validation, proof of proof that you're solving a need, you're doing it in a way that can scale, you know, and and people are, are genuinely addicted uh, to what you're doing. I think that's the right time. By the way, with, with both angels and VCs, I always like to say you should start talking to them when you have some – when you have – a series of interesting developments in your future because, again, it's creating that line, not a dot, right? Kind of say, hey, we're not raising right now, but we're going to be raising this fall. I'd love to put you on my my monthly update distribution list. And then if you have – and you do that when you start to have some news coming in. If you can do that and you send a monthly update to these guys uh, showing your progress every month, then when you actually say, all right, we're actually fundraising now, they've seen you execute over six months, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Tobias, thanks for the talk. Thank you. What are your thoughts on several corporate VCs in the first round? Oh, boy, that's a good one. So let's take that one first. Um, several corporate VCs in the first round. So, you know, let's not worry about the several portion of that. Let's just talk about corporate VCs in your round. Um, the thing about doing, like, strategic venture or corporate investors is just make sure that they – won't hamstring you. It's called the corporate bear hug. Uh, uh, they won't hamstring your growth or your ability to exit to someone else, right? And sometimes that's found in the terms and, you know, the term sheet. Um, you want to make sure they don't have blocking power or they just don't have a lot of control over your direction or your future. That's just one generic issue about taking corporate investors. Um, you know, and then I guess your thoughts on having several corporate VCs in the round, I would emphasize that even more. Make sure they, that you have wide latitude to run your business as you want to. Um, if they're on your board, they're going to have some pretty strong influence and control. And I guess I would just be a little bit worried about having too many cooks in the kitchen if you had a lot of you know, corporate VCs in the first round. But they can all, if, if corporate VCs can open up really solid distribution channels for you or provide some technical expertise that you won't get elsewhere, then it can be worth the, the, the strings attached. Okay, second question. If you have the chance to raise more than you initially wanted, should you go for it or rather wait for the next round? I think <laughs> in general you should probably raise more. Um, I've been through, so, you know, I started my career in 1990. Uh, I started working in investment banking in 1997, and then we had, you know, a huge market correction in 2000, um, you know, crash, and that was ugly for a couple of years, and then another crash in 2007, 2008, right? So I've seen a couple cycles where things get really ugly, um, and it can come on pretty quick. So I think if you have the opportunity to raise some additional money, you should, assuming the terms are, are decent. Okay, good. These are good questions. Anyone else got a question? We can we can um, wrap it up if not. Oh, there's here we go. Nikolai, if it's not possible to con concentrate full time on fundraising, what's the minimum amount of time you consider sufficient? For example, I'd be able to free up two days a week. Mhm. Mm yeah, that's a great question. And actually, you're already answering my answer. Um, if you're not able to, kind of, so a, this perfect scenario is maybe you have a co-founder and you can give your co-founder, give her all the jobs of, uh, you know, sales, marketing, customer happiness, whatever it may be, and all you do is fundraise. That's this perfect scenario. Second scenario is what you just said here. You carve off like Monday and Tuesday and maybe Friday, all you do is fundraise um, and try and pack all your meetings on those days. You know, I've seen that actually be fairly effective. I've seen it also where people try and, like, carve off half a day every day fundraising. I think it's actually more effective to just have two or three dedicated days a week where you're fundraising and, uh, you know, realize it's going to potentially bleed over, as you say. So, yeah, I think that's the <laughs> – you've, you've answered your own question. All right, view number 17. I have a previous investor who thinks it's good to join the road – 
you know, the round. I'm assuming you mean the round we're working on, not because the initial round is very big. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's a signal that they defend their percent of equity for the next round. We now have a good lead and I'm negotiating with the first uh, for this round. Yeah, I think that's really, there are a couple parts to this question about, you know, early investors who want to uh, come on to the next round. First of all, if your early investors don't want to come in, especially if they're a, a venture fund and they don't want to come into your next round, that's a big problem. Um, I remember having this conversation with my seed investor where I said, all right, I'm thinking about raising some more money. And I asked, are you guys going to come in and do a follow-on amount? I was super nervous. They said they would come in to the next round, but if we said, no, we're not, that's almost like a huge black mark or strike against you. So uh, really, really good that your early investors want to come in. I think I would even talk about that maybe in my pitch. Uh, you know, our, our early investors have seen our traction. They've got inside information. They want to come in to our next round. Um, and then I think, you know, this is kind of up to you. The next part of that is, you know, letting them in, right? Assuming there's a lot of demand for your round. Um, I, I'm a kind of loyal guy, so I like to reward those people who, who believed in me early on. So I would try and fight to get those early guys in. To the next round, you know, sometimes the later VCs don't want to let those guys in because they want to take more of the the the, the piece, uh, the pie. But you know, if your early people have been good to you and good supporters, I would fight to get them in. And by fighting, that means you know, negotiating with the new investors to get them in. Good. That's a really good question, by the way. Uh, Michael, how to determine the valuation? Well, so. I have a blog post on this. I'm happy to send you. Valuation is uh, more art than science at the early stages. Um, you know, a lot of it's a function of two things, really. What stage are you at? Are you at, you know, MVP stage? Are you at MVP VP plus some initial traction? Are you, you know, traction plus revenue? Are you revenue plus a scalable marketing plan, right? You can kind of almost do like evaluate like a step function at each of these stages where maybe your valuation is, you know, 2 million at that early, then it's 3 million, 5 million, 8 million, kind of stepping up um, as, you've, as you've proven your business and have a scalable business model, you know, your valuation is, can frankly be sky's the limit even at the early stages. Um, in the earlier stages, it's usually more of a, a range between say three and you know five million, um, and in many cases it's a function of, uh, like I said, what stage you're at, and also the interest level in your deal. If you have a lot of investors interested, obviously you, you have more leverage to ask and, and chase a higher valuation. Um, and then the third piece of that is is just your own uh, how do I put this politically correctly um, your own um, balls <laughs> to ask for a certain valuation, right? In many cases, it's just saying, I'm seeking a, uh, you know, raising a million dollars on a $5 million pre, and then you shut up. And you don't start arguing why you think you're worth that amount. You just say, I'm raising a $1 million on a $5 million pre, and that's what I'm targeting. You know, that's what you're asking for. That's what you're setting your price at, uh, your valuation at. And then, uh, you know, let them either complain about that or, or accept that, right? And that's how it works. That's how valuation works. Um, you don't need to hire an external uh, uh, valuation consultant for that or anything like that. All right, Max. So thanks for the talk. How to prepare due diligence for investors. Yeah, due diligence is a, uh, excuse my language, but a pain in the ass. Um, when we got into due diligence with our seed venture fund, they sent me a list of like 120 different items that I had to assemble. Everything from, you know, articles of incorporation in the company to uh, uh, bios of my employees and contractors and my contracts, like my, my uh, NDAs I have with engineers. I mean, everything about your business, you have to kind of compile it all. Um, I don't think you generally need to hire uh, an external person 
you, you just unless your stuff is a mess. I mean, if your books are a mess and your your legal your documents and structures a mess, then yeah, you need to get an attorney to help clean that up. Um, get your employees with proper documentation, things like that. But you know, in general, I think most founders can handle their own due diligence, assuming that again their company's not a mess. So. Um, you might have an attorney maybe look at anything, maybe kind of give a – so one way that due diligence works also is usually there will be either a data room or even a, a shared folder on, like, Google Drive where you're uploading all this stuff. So it might make sense to have an accountant or attorney kind of review that quickly once you've assembled it all, but it will cost you a fortune if you ask your attorney to, you know, compile all your due diligence for you. Um, Michael, this last question, I guess, where in the process it should be fixed without the context of the fundraising process? I don't understand your question there. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what, uh, where in the process, what should be fixed. Your, your evaluation? By the way, evaluation mainly comes into play when you're doing a priced round, you know, an equity round. Um, if you're doing a convertible note, then it's more about the cap, you know. So then you're saying I'm doing a, a convertible note, 15% 15 per, 15 discount to my next round, and my valuation cap is $8 million, for example. All right, guys, we're kind of coming up to uh, the end of this here. Unless there are any other burning questions, uh, I really appreciate you guys spending the time here. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to cut it off here. I will send this slide deck around. Um, really appreciate it. Have a great weekend, and um, you know, happy to answer additional questions if you have them. Uh, you'll get an email from me. <laughs> okay, actually, I'll, ask, I'll answer this last question. Zero number seventeen. What do you think is the most valuable asset for an early pitch? I've been saying this a lot lately to founders. If you took away your, you know, you had your entire 10 slide deck, your 12 page deck, and you cut away all the slides except for your traction slide, what would your pitch look like? I think in many ways that is kind of the most important slide. Like it's all the other stuff is important too, but if you just had that traction slide, what does that look like? Um, you know, that's kind of my quick take on that viewer number 15. On that note, go, go get out there and work on your traction and, um, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.